an essay on David Benatar's antinatalism, titled The Risk of Accepting the Antinatalist Conclusion, by Peter Petrovic. David Benatar is a South African philosopher and professor at University of Cape Town, most famous for writing Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. For the purpose of saving time, I won't explain David's antinatalist argument in excruciating length. Instead, I will assume that you are previously familiar with his work and will quickly offer a very short summary of his main points. David's position is, like mentioned, an antinatalistic one, meaning that procreation of sentient beings is morally wrong. The argument relies heavily on a kind of asymmetry. The absence of miserable life is good, but the presence of miserable life is always bad. Therefore, scenario B is preferable over scenario A. Scenario A. In scenario A, X exists. 1. Presence of miserable life. This is always bad. 2. Presence of happy life. This is good. Scenario B. In scenario B, X doesn't exist. 1. Absence of miserable life. This is good. 2. Absence of a happy life. Not bad. Surprisingly, David himself claims that he doesn't ground his normative morality in a kind of utilitarian meta-ethical framework. Instead, he claims that his position is compatible with various different foundations. This seems to indicate that his position is not an absurd product of some eccentric meta-ethical belief. Instead, the arguments hold their own weight. I shall challenge this by offering a risk analysis perspective and argue for different thresholds of truth. I will also argue that we ought not accept David Benatar's conclusions on the basis that we don't have the means to justify it, yet at least, and to do so would mean taking a risk we shouldn't take. I call this the moral asymmetry of risk. How we ought use reason. Humans have a limited cognitive ability. We cannot and never will be able to think deeply about every idea in the history of mankind. Even if we had vastly better intellectual capabilities than we possess today, for example, if every human had Einstein's intellect multiplied by ten, we would still then be limited by the fact that we are living finite lives. So naturally, we have to carefully choose what ideas and thoughts are worth exploring so as not to suffer from paralysis from over-analysis. The way we choose what ideas are worth thinking deeply about are in part what consequences said ideas might have when implemented or not. The more chance of a proposition being able to cause harm, the more intellectual work ought to be done to justify that belief. We simply need to uphold different thresholds of truth in order to operate efficiently. Consider that you're at work, and the night before you barely had any sleep after having discovered your wife has had an affair. Suddenly, a colleague comes into your office and asks you for help. You two work together often on various tasks and help each other on a regular basis. However, you really don't feel like helping anyone today. Given this, you decide to lie and claim that you are too busy to help him. Some may argue that this act is morally wrong, but whatever we believe, we need not grudge about this moment for the rest of our lives. The reason for this is that the consequences of our actions do not produce any great harm to sentient beings on earth. Contrast this with the decision to slaughter homosexual people solely based on their sexual preferences, as has been the case in many previous societies. Such actions carry heavy consequences. If we are wrong about the rightness of hanging homosexual individuals, then we are moral monsters. We should therefore take careful precautions when trying to justify such acts. If the justification comes from a holy book, for example, then we ought to be sceptical of that source and not accept it on its merits. However, if you argue that you should love all humans unconditionally and your justification for that is likewise a holy book, then we ought to be more prone to accept the latter proposition compared to the former. We can accept this, because if we are wrong about loving unconditionally, we, probably, won't produce a world in which sentient beings suffer more. Some people might call this a consequentialist argument, but I would argue that it is not necessarily strictly consequentialist in its nature. If only we can agree that some states of the universe are better than others, I believe we ought to scrutinize and uphold different thresholds of truth depending on the context. 
In fact, most of us already operate in this way, both for anthropological and psychological reasons, but most importantly, for practical reasons. Needless to say, a problem with this line of reasoning is of course that we cannot always know exactly how much and in what way our actions impact the well-being of other sentient creatures. We can happen to be wrong about what ideas are worth upholding to a higher threshold of truth, but I would still claim that as rational agents we can decipher and calculate it in approximate measures. To clarify, when using the term truth in the sentence higher threshold of truth, I am talking about something akin to standard, level or quality, not to be confused with a subjectivist view on morality where there might be multiple truths, future of well-being. It is very plausible that the future holds great things for humanity. Looking at just the past 400 years of history, each generation has been considerably better off than the previous one. If we keep up this pace, one cannot even imagine what levels of well-being society is capable of producing. It is not pure science fiction to imagine a society where nobody suffers from mental illness and where more than 99% of the population are living truly fulfilling and meaningful lives, free of suffering. Perhaps humanity will develop conscious AI systems who are capable of living extremely good and fulfilling lives, way beyond even our wildest imagination. We are perhaps not even capable of conceptualizing what levels of well-being are possible for beings more advanced than us. The risk of accepting David Benatar's antinatalism. I am using the word risk, in this context, very close to its dictionary meaning, a situation involving exposure to danger. The danger in this setting is morally abhorrent behavior and or undesirable results. It is hard to imagine anything riskier to the well-being of sentient beings than David Benatar's proposal. If he is wrong about this, he might be the greatest moral monster the universe has ever seen. If we accept antinatalism, we would destroy all future conscious beings on Earth. Ending humanity is the epitome of risky decisions, and therefore we ought to uphold it to utmost extreme scrutiny before we accept such an abhorrent conclusion. The problem with the claim, the absence of a happy life is not bad, is that even if we accept it today, it might not be true tomorrow. There is no reason to believe that this conclusion is static. Surely it's prone to change depending on what life forms. It manifests itself in and our knowledge about the meaning of well-being and the good life. Benatar might not agree with me on this point, but where else does he manufacture this statement from if not for empirical data points which bring him to this conclusion? Furthermore, even if I am wrong on this point, which of course I might very well be, the same problem arises with the statement, presence of a miserable human life is bad. Indeed, this may be true today, but the concept of a miserable life might not even be a reality in the future. We simply don't know yet. The assumption that life is always harmful might then not be correct. What is missing? Even if we accept David Benatar's argument today in the sense that the argument is not flawed, we ought not to execute mass antinatalism because the risk-truth threshold is so extremely high that we need extreme justification to carry out such action. Think of something akin to mathematical proof in order to do this. I believe, if David Benatar is correct, then subsequent generations will figure this out. Same if he is wrong. This is a gamble we cannot afford to take. I cannot stress this point enough as it is the core of my counter-argument. Benatar claims that his position is born out of the compassion he has for sentient beings. If this is true, then surely you cannot ignore the future possibilities of human flourishing. What if you're wrong? This is an unacceptable risk. We don't have sufficient grounds to accept his conclusion as of today. It might even be the case that it is impossible to give a justification for antinatalism in 2023. We may very well lack the moral and scientific knowledge to make such an extreme decision. If that is the case, then we will have to wait for future generations to produce such justification. Again, even if we accept the following logic, absence of a happy life is not bad, so who cares what the future holds for us? I happen not to agree with this statement, 
But for sake of argument, let's accept this. We still ought not to accept antinatalism because our moral knowledge is not akin to some kind of scientific certainty, and we would need that before we commit such a risky act. Perhaps even if his argument was stronger, I would still argue that we ought to be extremely careful accepting the conclusion, because if we are wrong, then we might have done something so wrong that it is completely unthinkable to imagine the wrongness of it. It may be the case that until we make moral philosophy something akin to natural science that we may never be able to justify such risky behaviour. I greatly respect David Benatar as a philosopher, and I would not consider his argument weak by any stretch of the imagination, however, to be able to justify Benatar's position. We would have to be absolutely positive that his conclusions are correct, and his arguments are simply not strong enough. Moral Asymmetry of Risk As Rivka Weinberg points out in her book The Risk of a Lifetime, Benatar resorts to using subjective means to stipulate objective facts in order to justify antinatalism. I believe this to be very good criticism, but even if we offer the benefit of the doubt to Professor Benatar, we still encounter what I shall name the moral asymmetry of risk. This argument is predicated upon the fact that the net benefit of executing antinatalism, if it happens to be the morally correct position, is marginal, but our loss might be close to infinite times greater. Scenario X, antinatalism is right. People suffer unnecessarily for thousands of years until humans figure this out and then sentient life ends on earth. This is good. Scenario Y, antinatalism is wrong. We kill all current and future generations of sentient beings on earth and become moral monsters. In Scenario X, when people suffer unnecessarily, we know in which way they will suffer. We are familiar with this suffering because we are constantly experiencing this. In Scenario Y, however, we might not even be able to comprehend the level of flourishing and well-being that's possible in the future. There doesn't seem to be a visible ceiling to well-being, but our suffering is very unlikely to become worse than it already is. This offers a further reason why we ought not accept Benatar's antinatalism. It may, however, be argued that we cannot accept Scenario X because what guarantees that humanity will figure this out? Firstly, we have no reason to believe that knowledge will not continue to grow exponentially. There is little evidence to suggest that our moral knowledge and curiosity will stagnate. Secondly, there's a greater likelihood in my estimation that our interest in moral knowledge will only continue to grow as we automate mundane working tasks and focus on things that truly matter in life. Given this disparity between Scenario X and Y, it is morally wrong to gamble on the conclusion. The risk-to-reward ratio is simply not great enough. If antinatalism is true, we might end some suffering humans endure, but if it is wrong, we may prevent a world where there is no suffering at all which produces unthinkable levels of well-being. To summarise my train of thought throughout this essay, excluding the moral asymmetry of risk, I shall present it in simple terms. 1. Humans possess limited knowledge and time, and there are infinite ways to spend our moral capacity on. 2. Therefore, we must choose what to focus on. We have to prioritise this according to risk. 3. The more risk, the more we ought to uphold it to a higher standard threshold of truth, evidence. 4. Antinatalism equal sign most risky thing ever. 5. Threshold of truth for must exceed beyond any doubt. 6. It doesn't uphold this standard of truth, evidence, even thought the argument is not bad. 7. We ought not accept the conclusion, yet at least. This, combined with the moral asymmetry of risk, is why we should not accept David Benatar's antinatalism. What would be needed? We need greater understanding of well-being and a more comprehensive scientific understanding of the world. We are not in a position to see the horizon of peak human flourishing. I say let's sail a bit further, and who knows, we might strike gold. I would argue that this is not only possible, but very likely. Like I mentioned earlier, historically, the world is getting better and better by pretty much every metric imaginable. Suffering is constantly being reduced. 
There's no reason to believe that this progress would stop or even slow down. Modern humans have been around for about 200,000 years and with recent technological revelation, we don't even know how much better life will be in a mere 500 years, which is not even that much time in the grand scheme of things.